Ryan, thanks for doing this. Let's uh, let's dive into Caleb Williams. You've been watching USC football a long time. Where does he rank in, you know, in the greats that you've watched playing or center for USC? Where does he fall? Yeah, Caleb Williams is right up there. Probably, I would say, at the top for me. When you look at the quarterbacks that USC's had, you know, with uh, I mean, there's some historic guys, but recently or in the last you know couple of decades, like a Carson Palmer winning the Heisman or Matt Leiner winning the Heisman, you know, guys like Matt Barkley, Sam Darnold, Caleb Williams just brings something different to the table. And the fact that he was able to come on the scene in the first year in Cardinal and Gold and win the Heisman Trophy, just the numbers he was able to put up and with a really terrible defense, how he was, you know, he willed that team to a lot of victories. It wasn't able to, to work out the, you know, this year, but last year what he was able to do, I thought was pretty special. And I've talked to some of those great quarterbacks like a Matt Leinart will tell you like, yeah, he's, he's someone that you just haven't seen like that before. So he's, he would be the number one player I've ever seen uh, wearing Cardinal and gold for USC. So that's, you know, going back 30 years or whatever, but they, you know, I, I can't say before that, but just as far as those guys go, I mean, it's just really hard to beat what Caleb Williams kind of brought to the table. I hate to be a prisoner of the moment, but is he also perhaps the most polarizing out of all of those guys you mentioned? You know, that's an interesting question with, uh, you know, painting his fingernails uh, and right. things like that. He's he's a he's a more modern college football player. And I think that, you know, crying after a loss, you know, talking to people in the NFL circles, they're like, well, he really cared about winning. And it wasn't like they didn't look they didn't. I, the people I've talked to didn't see that was a ding against him. But some people in the media, uh, especially people that didn't like Caleb Williams already. And there's you know, a bunch of those. Uh, would kind of be critical of things like that. But just being around him, I mean, I was at a Laker game a uh, month or so ago, walking off, and uh, Caleb Williams was courtside. And as Kevin Durant is walking off of the court, he comes over to Caleb Williams and daps him up. And you're just like, this isn't happening in college football 10 years ago. Even when I covered Matt Leinart, like People Magazine would come to practice trying to interview him because he was dating – uh, whoever the you know local celebrity was that you know from MTV's latest TV show or whatever, so that was kind of the first sort of crossover. But Caleb Williams has kind of taken it to another level. I mean, we saw like DJ Ungulale like getting some national commercials, but I don't think it was the way Caleb Williams was with the Heisman House and Dr Pepper and everything. And I think there was a lot going on, you know, just kind of his life, but. Because of NIL and the transfer portal and everything that's happened, it just sort of set up really well for someone like Caleb Williams to ascend as quickly as he did. And I think that, to your original question, could kind of make him a, a polarizing uh, figure. You mentioned the media. What's the biggest false narrative you think is out there surrounding Caleb Williams? Now, that's a good question. I think that, I mean, when you, he's a genuine person that I feel like, has handlers, has people around him just because of everything that he's been able to do. But when he's bringing his offensive linemen to the Heisman ceremony or to when he was throwing out the first pitch for his bobblehead night, he has his own bobblehead for Dodger Stadium, um, crazy <laughs> stuff like that. He's bringing offensive linemen with him. And I think that's a genuine, that's a genuine article. He's not doing that because cameras are around or whatever. And if you watch the Holiday Bowl, where you know he opts out, and he's going to get ready for the NFL draft. And Miller Moss, his longtime uh, backup, uh, was there, and you know was former four-star quarterback. He ends up throwing for six touchdowns. It was a USC record for a bowl game. And you know Caleb Williams is one of his biggest cheerleaders and biggest supporters. And it's one of those things where it, I, he's behind the scenes. I think he's doing a lot of genuine things. It's not just stuff for the camera. So if you if you're looking at him and he's like this kind of prima donna, there was you know, um, stories about him wanting a piece of a NFL franchise. Like that. I never got that kind of impression from him. So there's, I think there's a genuine genuineness to him, but there's also, I mean, there's been so much hype and so much buildup around him. He's kind of this like celebrity that's still trying to be, uh, you know, like a, a regular college kid, which it was really hard to do the kind of situation he was in. Are there any red flags that you've seen? that would give a general manager pause? You know, it's like if you, a lot of the intangible stuff I think happens with quarterbacks where if you, you know, if it's a Johnny Manziel or Baker Mayfield, there's like a whole lot of other stuff going on. There's like that athleticism and, 
you know, drive to win, but maybe he's not the most, you know, buttoned up guy. I, I feel like he's got a lot of that stuff taken care of. Like he will take care of the business part of things. He will be well represented as if you're going to be like, this is the face of your franchise. I think he can be, you know, a guy like that. Uh, to me, it's just of, you know, how does the game translate? And when people make comps and you look at, uh, you know, the, the kind of NFL quarterbacks like a Patrick Mahomes, just the arm angles and what he's able to do improvising. I feel like that's sort of, you know, what makes him him. Um, and can, you know, to me, it's always about making that jump to the next level. We see it high school to college, college to the NFL. My gut would be he's going to be able to make that jump. But I think that's the only thing is, can he keep doing what he was doing at the college level and, and, you know, do it at the, at the NFL level. So I, that's kind of the one for just about everyone. But I think the intangible stuff, um, the business side, you know, being the face of a franchise, number one pick and all that, I think, I think he'd pr probably have that down pretty good. We are heading knee deep into, you know, mock draft season. Are you expecting oh. somewhat of a teardown for <laughs> Caleb Williams? Do you think that's coming for him? Yeah, I'm I'm not a big mock draft guy. Sorry if uh, you are. It just changes. <laughs> no. Like it's like bowl projections in college. Like they're it's week three and they're projecting. I'm like, how would you even know? And um, you know, there's all this misinformation kind of going out there. I feel like it's basically when you're anointed the number one guy, now you have to find reasons why you're not. And uh, could it be Michael Penix who's come on and just looks? I mean, I've followed him. You know, the last couple of years, he's been an amazing quarterback. Or Drake May, or there's different guys like that. Marvin Harrison, I think they will all sort of be, you know, in the conversation. But at the end of the day, you know, you see what he's able to do. Um, you know, he's, he can run strong, you know, the arm angle stuff, he can throw it all over the field. Uh, keep the vision, I think, is really important. You know, it's one of those things where if you can escape, um, if you have a really good pocket presence, you can kind of escape the, the pass rush, still having the ability to look downfield and see what's, you know, what's available throw it away if you have to make a big chunk play down the field. I think he does all that kind of stuff. Well, when you, when you look at the tape, I think you're going to say over and over, okay, well, he's, he's the number one guy and we're going to try to find a reason why he's not. So I'm sure they'll do that. But at the end of the day, I'm guessing he's still going to be the number one guy. And that's because of the off schedule throws the, you know, the, the comps he gets to Patrick Mahomes. You think that even though we will see, you know, and they will move, right? These mock drafts, they will change. They'll move Drake May up, and they'll talk about his size and how much he's more prototypical. Yeah. And Michael Penix Jr., we know that passing ability, and so perhaps he may jump. But by the time we get to day one of the NFL draft, you believe it's going to be Caleb Williams because of that skill set? Yeah, I think so. And there's just, you know, it's one of those it factors, too, where he just seems to have it. And there's a, you know, there are so many plays we've seen at USC. And it, it's hard to put in perspective how bad their defense was, where there was pressure on him to score every single time uh, he had the football. And there was a lot of pressure on him from pass rushes and the offensive line and, and different defenses dropping a lot of guys back in coverage. And he just seems to figure out a way, whatever the situation is, it's just like, you're like, this, he's an engineer. There's a, a there's a problem in front of you. We got to figure out a way uh, to, to, to fix this. And he just seems to have that, an ability that he can just kind of figure out what needs to be done. And I know it's going to be, you know, it's tougher to do that. Uh, and then NFL, but you know, he's thrown into tight windows. He's escaped crazy pass rushes and been able to pick up yards with his legs or, or find somebody uh, downfield. I, I think you're going to kind of look at the whole body of work at the end of the day. You're like, all right, this is, this is why we feel like he's, you know, the potential to be the next kind of, you know, version of Patrick Mahomes. And that's worked really well, obviously, in the NFL where you can, you're not just fully going uh, rogue all the time. And, you know, we've seen that from players and sometimes it's, that's tough, but you can follow sort of the constructs of the offense and, you know, everyone has a great plan. until you get punched in the face. It was that Mike Tyson saying something like that. Right, uh, when you right. do get punched in the face, figuring out like, okay, well now I got to like, you know, Bob weave, whatever I got to do and figure things out. So I, I feel like they'll follow, he'll follow the offense where, you know, some GMs and some, you know, office reporters don't want you to just go do whatever you want. But if things do break down, then he has the ability to kind of fix the, if it was a bad play call or just, you know, someone missed a block, whatever it is, he can kind of be that eraser to sort of fix whatever problems are going on uh, around him. Sometimes that's tough. You know, I think 
maybe like Bryce Young, as you know, it, it's been harder for him to sort of fix the sort of deficiencies that have been around him. Or CJ Stroud kind of, you know, came into the situation and he sort of like makes whatever you're, you're making lemonade out of lemons. And, uh, and I feel like that's what, you know, Caleb Williams can do that even if it's not the greatest situation, he's going to still do a couple of things to sort of put you in the position to, you know, potentially succeed on whatever play it is. You know, so much of us wonder how Ryan Poles, the general manager, feels about Caleb Williams. And I, I would venture to guess Caleb Williams probably wants to know how Ryan Poles feels about him because that <laughs> that is going to dictate, you know, where he goes, if it's number one overall or what team he goes to. It's, uh, you know, inquiring minds want to know. We're going to have to just wait and see. But, uh, Ryan, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time. No, my pleasure. 